Hello, my beautiful botanists. So luckily, we are still getting to do our fungal content. So onward with the show. Kingdom fungi part two, we are talking about macro fungi. So these are gonna be two major groups of fungi that um, make macroscopic fruiting bodies, things that we can see with our naked eyes. We left off talking about um, the micro fungi. So our chytridiomycota, which isn't, it is still a group, but now um, there's a few other groups of chytrids as well that aren't all um, necessarily directly from that same ancestor. Um, we had the same situation with the zygomycota, so that's been broken into a couple different groups as well. The glomeromycota were our endomycorrhizal fungi. Um, so these are all ones where the fruiting bodies are gonna be things that we have to see under a microscope, but we are transitioning into what are called the higher fungi, um, and we'll also call them macro fungi. So our first group we're gonna look at is the ascomycota. So this is a huge group of fungi, um, some of the most well-described, um, definitely the most species that we have described so far belong to this group. They have simple septations, so that means that in their hyphae, they have, let's see if I can draw here, no longer are they just cenocytic, right, where there's, you see no septa, now we have septations. So that's going to look like a little hole through um, the middle of the septum. So instead of just having um, these continuous strands, those strands will be broken up into individual little cells, but there's still the ability for stuff to move through. Their spores are produced inside a bag-like structure called an ascus, and so that's what you see down here. If you're going to talk about multiple, we would call them asci. So each of those asci has um, eight ascospores inside. And they're produced um, always in these eights because you get um, meiosis happening, which gives you four cells, but then you get this round of mitosis, which then replicates each of those. So very interesting and weird. Um, also, we are moving into this dikaryotic phase where instead of having plasmogamy, where the cytoplasm comes together, and karyogamy, where the nuclei fuse, happening basically one right after the other, now we have this extended time where two haploid strands um, will fuse together and plasmogamy happens, but then you just have those two separate nuclei of different types floating around together. Um, and so we see that first happening in the ascomycota. And so we're gonna call that N plus N because there's two different nuclei, so there's two sets of chromosomes, but it's not diploid because they haven't fused together. So if we look at these um, different ways that ascomycetes are making their fruiting bodies, we can start with our earliest ascomycetes, at least we think they're the earliest, um, and they don't have them in any kind of structure. They just make the acai naked on the surface, so they're not contained really within anything. Um, one local example that you might see of that happens to red alders. I think it happens to white alders too, but we don't really get those until you go inland. So if you look at alder cones and if they ever have these like, it looks like fingernails when they grow really long and get curly. Um, if you ever saw that in like the Guinness Book of World Records or something, that same <laughs> looking thing happens to these alder cones where they get infected by a fungus called tephrina and it just makes these powdery white looking assai on the, the extended bracts of these cones. Um, and so be on the lookout for those. It's a, it's a fungal infection. Another option is to make the assay inside of this closed structure. So I always go kleist when I try to think about the name of this. So a kleistothesium is this um, kind of spherical enclosed uh, fruiting body where the assay are inside. One of the most common places you're going to see that are the um, powdery mildews, which make these little kleistothesia. You can see them here, these little yellow balls. And inside of those, they're going to produce assai, but those assai, instead of being these sort of long bags, um, are going to be um, kind of more globular. Another option is to make a parathesium. Um, and so the naked assai, the kleistothesia, and the parathesia, these are all generally microscopic features. So we still have some um, 
microfungi aspects to our ascomycota. A parathesium is flask shaped, so kind of like a bottle where it has a neck and then this lower portion. And that neck can be really long or really short. And this opening is called the osteole, which we'll see in lab. So in a parathesium, um, generally these are going to be um, embedded within a structure, but sometimes they're free living. Like there's one called nectria, which makes these little pink to red to orange um, parathesia that kind of look like, I don't know, little fruits that sit on the top of a surface. But most of the time you're going to see them embedded in something. So in lab, you're going to look at a cross section of xylaria, which you see here, where the parathesia, each of these, are embedded inside the structure. So what we're looking at is one of these, and we're looking at a cross section through it. And if you, when they're in their totally black stage, they're covered with all these little bumps. And those little bumps are the osteoles right there, where there's a parathesium underneath, and it's making sexual spores. Later, they turn white, and then they start making asexual spores called canidia. So this has two spore stages that it goes through. It's sexual stage and it's asexual stage. Our last option that we have, well, there's a lot of options, but our last sort of common main option is the apothecium. And so in this, you have a generally cup-like structure where the apothecia line the top of it. So on the left is a picture of scutellinia, the eyelash cup fungus. Um, and these are just sort of these decorative hairs on the outside. The apothecia, or sorry, not the apothecia, the assi are lining this apothecium on the inside, um, but they're um, not necessarily visible to the naked eye. There's only, I think, one group that really makes assi that you can see, and that's called a scobolus. It's really cool. So what does this shape have to do with this shape? <laughs> These are both apothecia. One is its normal cup, and the other one has a cup turned inside out, and that's all pocketed. So the assi here are just lining this whole structure on the outside. Pretty fun. That's a morel. So what do all of these things have in common? They all make their spores inside an ascus. And so all of our ascomycota, that's how we're going to identify them. They're named after how they produce their spores, right? What is their sexual reproduction? And you'll find that with all of our fungal groups is that they're named after how they sexually reproduce. And so we have ascospores inside an ascus. That's what you're looking for for our ascomycota. Ta-da! Okay, so thinking about um, ways that ascomycota can kind of associate with other organisms or different shapes they can take, um, ascomycetes are involved in almost all lichen associations. I think maybe less than 1% are basidiomycota, um, and they make cool little tiny fungi um, or mushrooms. But most of the lichens that you're going to see around and the things that you would think of as lichens are ascomycete um, as the, the um, mycobiont. Um, some ascomycota form micro ectomycorrhizal relationships with trees, um, and so some of those you're going to see, some you're not going to see. Um, things like helvella, which kind of looks like a black, lumpier morel, um, is going to be one of those ectomycorrhizal ascomycetes. Um, we have a lot of unicellular ascomycetes, so those are um, going to be called yeasts, right? Any of our unicellular fungi. And the ones that we primarily use for making bread and alcohol are from the ascomycota, so saccharomyces. And the majority of molds um, that we tend to see around, there are a lot of molds out there because um, molds are just asexually reproducing fungi. But a lot of the molds that we do see are ascomycete molds. This one is a really cool one. Um, so you can see here, this is the asexual stage of, I don't know, could be pleurotus or who knows, um, but it's one that's a nematode trapper. So what they do is they make these rings of hyphae and then once they get touched, there's a little touch sensor, right? And so once it gets touched, it triggers it to inflate with water and that inflation causes constriction. So if there's something here, 
like this poor nematode, it gets trapped. So it lassoes that nematode as it crawls through, constricts it, and then digests it. Pretty fun. Another important role of the ascomycetes is that a lot of them are plant diseases and some of them are super destructive. So underneath my face where you can't see, there's a little parathesium with a really long neck and that belongs to an ascomycete called Cryphonectria parasitica. And that is the destroyer of the American chestnut, um, which is a tree that not a lot of people know about anymore, but used to be kind of like the redwood of the East Coast. So here those trees are. Here's a little dude standing amidst those trees. Here he is, looks pretty cool. Um, but look how huge those trees are. They are um, very uh, picturesque um, and were a real kind of icon for the East Coast. And so this Cryphonectria parasitica was introduced somewhere from Southeast Asia, um, maybe brought in on um, ornamental trees through the plant trade or on lumber, um, but it got into our um, trees on the East Coast. And so because they did not evolve in the same place as that particular pathogen, the pathogen killed those trees as opposed to just sort of causing a mild infection because they didn't have any defenses to it. So that happens a lot with plant diseases is that they have, um, they're native to a place with a particular uh, plant and fungus together or plant and pathogen together and they evolve fighting each other. And so each one has defenses for the other. But then um, when you move it to a new place, you have maybe a closely related plant that it can infect, uh, but that plant has no defenses. And so it, the pathogen isn't trying to necessarily kill it, but it does. Because um, as a pathogen, you want your hosts to survive enough so that you have stuff to eat and that you can reproduce. Um, but in this case, all the American chestnuts on the East Coast got wiped out and they can re-sprout and grow, but the pathogen still lives in the soil. Um, and so there hasn't been a real way to reestablish the um, American chestnut, which is pretty sad. They're crossbreeding it with ones that are native um, to the region where the disease came from, and that has provided some success, um, but we don't have the old giant trees that we used to. Okay, so for our ascomycota, we're looking for that ascus. Um, they can take a lot of different forms, but all of them are gonna have these usually eight spores contained within this sac-like structure. So they're produced inside that sac. For the basidiomycota, you can guess that their sexual reproduction is gonna have to do something with this word basidio. 